I forgot. Welcome back to the Ephemeris Podcast. I'm your host, Aphelion, and in the process of submitting applications throughout the week last week, I simply forgot that I had promised that there would be an episode on Wednesday, even though this podcast episode did take like four hours to prepare, um, which might have been for the better. What was to be of Wednesday's episode is now in Sunday's episode, which is about Subramanian Chandrasekhar. And so he's most well known for the Chandrasekhar limit, which is the limit on the mass of a stable white door. And a lot of his uh, work is going to be on stellar cores, um, sort of uh, stability in uh, like regular main sequence stars. So we're going to get into all of that today. And we'll see that Chandrasekhar is influential in more ways than just this. But as we always do, we will start the podcast episode with some biographical details. So, Chandrasekhar was born in 1910 in Lahore, which is uh, current day Pakistan, but at the time was in India. And his family settled in Madras, which is now Chennai, in 1918. Uh, Chandrasekhar was the ch- third child of 10 in his family, and he was homeschooled until the age of 12. And then he learned mathematics and physics in middle school from his father. And he attended high school uh, in the Hindu school in Madras. So he also went to the presidency college in Madras afterward. He received a BS in physics. And then he received a scholarship from the government to do graduate studies at Cambridge, which is interesting. Um, I mean, there are definitely educational, like, government programs that happen but receiving a scholarship from the uh from the government specifically to go somewhere to do graduate studies is pretty unique i would say and uh yeah so he was admitted into the trinity college in cambridge so that's a quick synopsis on his life and we will now transition into chandra's work Uh, The first to discuss is an introduction to the study of stellar structures written in 1939. And this will give us a good idea of what kind of foundations Chandra is working on or working above uh, when he's getting into his later works, which won't have as much details as this one. So let's um, get into the key points from this work. The first, quote, An expansion or contraction of a spherical distribution of matter is said to be uniform if the distance between any two points is altered in the same way as the radius of configuration. So that's one part that he establishes early on, um, sort of an introductory statement, um, not too confusing, pretty self-explanatory, if you can imagine the expansion or contraction of a star. It would happen like relative uh, to its it would happen like, you know, proportionally with its original radius. The next quote, uh, by a uniform expansion of a sphere, the density, pressure, and temperature at every point alters according to the inverse third, fourth, and unit power, respectively, of the ratio of, t- of the initial to the final radius. So this is sort of looking at the different factors of stars. You got density, which is altering to the inverse third power pressure, uh, inverse fourth power, and temperature unit power. So um, that's very cool to see expanding on some of the factors. Uh, And then thus, if a gas sphere expands or contracts uniformly through a sequence of equilibrium configurations, which you might imagine happens in the kappa mechanism, uh, which is the mechanism that we use to explain a lot of variability in stars, Uh, then the matter at every point undergoes a polytropic change. And yeah, polytropic uh, change is just a fancy way of saying or describing these thermodynamic processes that are happening in a star. Um, So yeah, these are some very important conclusions that are going to make a lot of the modern theories on stellar structure possible, even though they're quite basic. As I said, you know, Kappa mechanisms and there are some other uh, systems. I know there's a specific one for Cepheids that involves the ionization of helium, um, which is another mechanism. So all of these different um, mechanisms or even theories about how stellar structures work kind of rely on 
uh, the stuff that Chandra has put on, put in the work. Uh, Chandra also derives and discusses virial theorem, theorem in this work, which is a general equation that relates the average uh, over time of the co total kinetic energy of a stable system of discrete particles bound by conservative force, which is forces characterized exclusively by their work, it uh, that the equation relates that to the total potential energy of the system. So that will pop up a couple of times in a lot of Chandra's work, but yeah, it basically has to do with like energy, and I think he's you know talking specifically about thermodynamics and you know how that applies to situations of stars. There's also this very simple idea, again, that pops up, which is really nice to talk about. There's a certain analogy between radiation and a perfect gas. The energy of both depends on temperature, and both exert pressure. According to the electromagnetic theory of light, which was um, created by Maxwell, just to be clear, uh, the pressure exerted is one-third the times the radiation per unit volume, and here, Chandra explicitly states what has kind of already been discovered and might be obvious, but I will break it down really quickly. Um, let's talk about the first thing. So he said he compares radiation and perfect gas. For perfect gas, how it depends on temperature. Um, basically, you can imagine like the ideal gas law is a way that creates a relationship between you know. Um, uh, a gas is like moles or volume to its temperature and stuff like that. So that's kind of where this idea of um, a perfect gas depending on temperature comes in. And obviously gases exert uh, pressure because they come with hydrostatic forces that are exerted uh, within some area. And then there's the second part, which is radiation. And this one's a little bit more complicated, but still decipherable. So black body radiation energy, which is pretty much being referenced in um, this quote here, is dependent on temperature because such was dis discovered by Josef Stefan and Ludwig Boltzmann in what is called the Stefan Boltzmann law. And by the way, I've looked into Josef Stefan before in kind of determining um, astronomers to uh, discuss. Uh, in this season, and I tell you what, if you're into advanced calculus, he has some very, very, very cool uh, stuff that he's done in mathematics in his life, so I would recommend uh, for all you advanced calculus people to go and look into him. He's got some cool, um, he's got a cool constant, he's got like a formula, he's, he's probably got a law too, um, yeah, all around cool guy. So to understand the reason why radiation also exerts pressure, which, you know, going back to the quote, right? Um, let's imagine this. At the atomic level, when an electron drops into a lower orbital, it emits a photon. And you might say that this acts like a momentous collision because, you know, when we consider 2D momentum collisions in um, classical physics, you could think of like, even a dynamite bursting into like three pieces, let's say, right? And that becomes a momentous collision because, you know, you have all that stuff going on. So almost a similar thing going on here when an electron drops into a lower orbital, just a little bit more complicated. And let's just take that as a given in this situation. Obviously, the photoelectric effect is still very much in development during this time. Uh, in science, but for now, let's take that as a given. Now, imagine this momentous collision process I just described happening in innumerable times at the surface of a star. The momentum changes that are occurring on the surface area of a star will actually cause pressure on said surface because there's like a disturbance in the um, electromagnetic field when this occurs. And so that's pretty much the definition of radiation pre pressure or light pressure. And as you'll know, if you've studied um, stars at least a little bit and their stability, there are two forces that keep it stable. Uh, there is gravitational, uh, the gravitational force that brings it inward and there's the light pressure that pushes it outward. So I think that tells you a lot about how important these ideas are here. 
So yeah, some other key points to consider from this work. Uh, quote, if a gas is enclosed in a rigid spherical shell impermeable to heat and left to itself for a sufficiently long time, it settles into the condition of gross thermal equilibrium by conduction of heat till the temperature becomes uniform throughout. But if it were stirred artificially all through its volume, currents not considerably disturbing the static distribution of pressure and density, will bring it ap approximately to what I've called convective equilibrium of temperature. And if you think about like um, possibly some real universe applications of this idea, I think there is some truth to be found. Um, for me, when I listen to this quote, I just think about like the uh, sun's hydrodynamics with, you know, it's got like solar flares and all of these crazy things going on. And from those events, we can tell that it's not perfectly uniform and it goes through a lot of convection with like the, the core being like 27 million degrees and then the uh, solar flares being um, 3.5 million degrees, but then the surface being only like 10,000 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So yeah, um, with that dynamic, we, can, we might be able to apply it to this quote um, where there's sort of a convective equilibrium where it's it's staying stable because it's like um it's doing a lot of convection and that wouldn't be the case if it was just a perfect um rigid spherical shell but um i will admit that there it's likely not what is meant here um what i've said just uh just now due to mentions of artificial stirring which, yeah, I don't think that fits with the idea of the hydrodynamics of the sun, but I think the ideas have some connections, which is why um, I'm mentioning them. Later on, Chandra considers whether the variability of a star's surface leads to a complete dispatch of stellar matter or simply an eddy. And he presumably uh, leans more towards this I eddy idea when he states, quote, in general, the magnitude of the eddy velocities will be determined by the balance of energy which becomes available to the eddies from the mean internal energy and the energy lost by the eddies through viscous dissipation. So, yeah, that's another really, really nice idea that's adding to this um, sort of overarching concept of mechanisms that might explain um, star variability. Afterwards, uh, Chandra discusses the elemental makeup of stars when interpreting the Hertzsprung diagram. He discusses the giant branch and the Hertzsprung gap. Uh, he also discusses solutions to identifying hydrogen and helium contents in stars. And then he introduced some new concepts about stellar envelopes, which we've kind of been building towards. Uh, a lot of this has been general um, thermodynamics which might apply to, you know, as we talked about variability, but here now we're going into stellar envelopes. And um, if you know anything about protoplanetary nebulae, uh, stellar and envelopes matter very much. And in fact, you can also probably um, apply this to variable stars equally. So let's get to what um, Chandra has to say about stellar envelopes. Quote, a study of stellar envelopes has a twofold importance for astrophysical theories. First, it extends the region of the study of the conventional stellar atmospheres into the far interior. And second, it also has a very definite bearing on the studies of the deep interiors, which are our main concern in this monograph. So yeah, he concludes that the stellar envelopes support theories of stellar structures of many stars analyzed in the work. And you can imagine that there are many stars that have some very different things going on with the layers that occur within them, right? Because as main sequence stars evolve, they get like uh, multiple, multiple layers of different elemental makeups and different types of fusion with like hydrogen fusion happening in certain shells and helium fusion happening in certain shells and heavy elemental um, fusion uh, happening in other shells, possibly later down the line. So yeah, that's something that Chandra recognizes here and something that we can um, give him props for. Lastly, Chandra Seeker inv investigates white dwarfs, which is 
at the time an anomaly. Quote, we thus see that the material of the white dwarf must be almost entirely degenerate. This result is implicitly contained in Fowler's work, but the arguments, essentially in the form we have given them, are due to Stromgren and Seidentoff. Hopefully I'm saying those names correctly. Uh, and that right there is very, very critical because what we know about white dwarfs today is that they are supported by electron degeneracy pressure. And it seemed like Chandra had this figured out in his beginning works in uh, 1940. And we will see that he will likely um, build on this degeneracy idea. He also states, quote, we have thus proved that the maximum mass of a stellar configuration which consistent with the physics of degenerate matter can be wholly regarded as wholly or sorry can be regarded as wholly degenerate and uh, he basically attributes an equation to this whole idea so that is the introduction to the study of stellar structure and from there uh, Chandler Shaker begins to involve himself in stellar dynamics and this is where a little bit of sort of a, a feud begins to occur between Arthur Eddington and uh, S. Chandra Shekhar. You see, before Chandra, Eddington had postulated ideas of an ellipsoidal hypothesis for stellar systems, which had principal velocity surfaces, which is a one-dimensional foliation into surfaces caused by orthogonal, I think it's uh, eigenvectors, uh, but I might be pronouncing that wrong. So I've obviously uh, I'm gonna I'm not as familiar with linear algebra, so I cannot really further break down this idea. But I do recognize that this terminology might be recognized by those who do. So I have included it here. Um, the ellipsoidal hypothesis is um, a bit of a complicated uh, hypothesis simply because it involves. Um, sort of cylindrical um, geometry. And um, so again, I won't be able to break that idea down completely here, but I do want to mention it just because this is a part of Chandra Shaker's work. And um, because Eddington said this, uh, he didn't really like the underlying assumptions behind principal velocity surfaces. And his disagreement on these ideas is what makes up a core part of the principles of stellar dynamics, which is his next work. And according to a paper that summarizes this piece, uh, quote, Chandrasekhar is completely correct. Eddington assumed that the eigenvectors of the velocity dispersion tensor are the tangent vectors of a triply orthogonal system of surfaces. This is a sufficient but not a necessary consequence of the orthogonality of the eigenvectors of the dispersion tensor. Again, Lots of complicated terminology that I will not be able to break down for you, but uh, just giving you some um, really surface level uh, understanding of, you know, what's really going on when we um, talk about uh, the part of Jandra's work that was sort of a, starting to become a feud with Eddington because they didn't uh, agree on certain ideas. So, yeah, I just wanted to leave that in there. There are some other works of Chandrasekhar as well beyond this, and I'm going to start covering them in a bit of a non-chronological order here. The first one is the mathematical theory of black holes, and in portions of the text, Chandra explores the perturbed state of black hole solutions using Einstein's and Maxwell's field equations, because um, I think what he had established in this piece is that looking into Schwarzschild black holes, um, was, a, I think, a little bit more of a stable state of black holes because, as you'll remember, Schwarzschild black holes are one that, ones that don't have angular man, momentum or electric charge. So um, Chandra is sort of looking at black holes that aren't exactly this way. And Chandra der derives the Schwarzschild metric in a way that gets at the essence of space-time according to the work and according to himself. And a couple of just things that seem to be a common theme in the work, he was using radial geodesics, which comes up quite often in the work, 
in the case of zero angular momentum, which you might remember is a characteristic of the Schwarzschild black hole and what I've already stated. And he finds, quote, with respect to an observer stationed at infinity, a particle describing a time-like time -like trajectory will take an infinite time to reach the horizon, even though by its own proper time it will cross the horizon in finite time, and it will take finite time for the particle to reach the singularity. So, interesting ideas. Um, obviously, Schwarzschild comes around and establishes this event horizon, and now... Uh, Chandra is really taking those ideas a little bit further. Uh, there's some other crazy stuff that uh, Chandra gets into into this work. Um, he messes with like Schwarzschild space time, discussing gravitational waves surrounding a black hole, investigating Newman Penrose formalism, whatever that is. So lots of crazy stuff. Um, I'm not gonna get too deep into this because I mean, it, it would be very, very, very difficult to break down all of that applied math and um, content, physical content around simply theories of a black hole. So, yeah. Uh, then there is hydrodynamics and hydromagnetic stability, which doesn't sound too astronomy-like, but sections of the text uh, take hydrodynamics and apply them in a spherical geometry context, sort of, you know, considering spherical shells again, where thermal instability may occur, and he dives deeper into gravitational equilibrium and gravitational instability using Virial theorem again. And lastly, we have stochastic problems in physics and astronomy, which deals with Brownian motion, which is the random motion of particles suspended in a medium. And you might be like, well, that's not astronomy then, is it? And to you, I would say in stellar dynamics, a massive body can experience Brownian motion as it responds to gravitational forces from surrounding stars. So there you go. And basically what Chandra does in stochastic is examine the dynamics of the gravitational fields for the situations, um, random distributions of stars and you know other statistical probabilities, rate of escape of stars from their systems and much more. Uh, he at times considers the existence of magnetic fields in spiral arms of galaxies, other times the polarization of light and the dimness uh, or the dimming of galaxies, uh, other times just magnetic fields posing a problem to gravitational stability because it makes things too stable, and uh, other times just the equilibrium of stars utilizing magnetic fields. Uh, but we obviously cannot discuss Chandrasekhar's work without mentioning the many works he did around white dwarfs and discovering the Chandrasekhar limit. And um, the three works that um, kind of build around the Chandrasekhar limit itself are, are the maximum mass of ideal white dwarfs, the density of high, white, white, sorry, well, I don't know what just happened there, the density of white dwarf stars, uh, the highly collapsed configurations of a stellar mass, where Chandra essentially discovers a differential that governs the structure of a degenerate gas sphere in hydrostatic equilibrium, as said by himself. So those are the three works that are specifically building towards the Chandra Shaker limit. And in addition to these, there are multiple publications in which Chandra looks into stellar cores, which does not correspond exactly to um, the limit itself, but it uh, really dives deeper into uh, white dwarfs as a stellar remnant of many stars and things like that. So that concludes the work of Subramanian Chandra Shekhar. And before I go, I must mention once again that Chandra was one who overcame racism in his field through several throughout several points in his career, which is very, very commendable. Um, and yeah, just um, sort of being, I guess, the first of uh, South Asian minority to come into this field and make a make, make a big mark. Sorry, I apologize. My speech is getting worse and worse as this episode goes on. But that is all I have for today. Thank you guys so much for listening to this podcast episode. If you have made it till the end, I sincerely appreciate your support. As you know, I mentioned in the beginning of uh, the episode, 
it took me like four hours to get this thing done so the fact that you guys watched till the end makes me very very happy and to see that the you know average watch times tend to be uh greater than usual is always a nice sight when i'm looking at those youtube analytics so um yeah um that's all i've got for today until i guess next week i'll see you see you all later peace